Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion for the last day of September 2015. The top story, obviously, Hurricane Joaquin in the western Atlantic approaching the Bahamas. Hurricane warnings up for a good portion of the central Bahamas. Hurricane watch for the northwestern Bahamas as Joaquin closes in here, moving just south of west. And then it is expected to turn north and then possibly hook around an upper level low from this trough that's going to carve out over the eastern United States, closing off as an upper level low. I'm going to show you this from the amazing graphics of the GFS. It's awesome that the INSEP, the National Center for Environmental Prediction, gives us free access as taxpayers in this country to all the different layers of the GFS publicly available, and I'm going to explain it to the best of my ability. So this is the track, obviously a lot of concern for people all up and down the East Coast, and for good reason. Before this ever even potentially poses a threat for landfall, you're going to have some serious swells coming into the southeast, a huge heavy rain event setting up for this portion of the country. I'm going to show you that as well. Getting into the mechanics of what's happening with Joaquin, one of the very important aspects of this is obviously sea surface temperature. But more important perhaps than that, when we're talking about the energy in the ocean, is the upper ocean heat content values. And this map is fantastic. It is from the uh, AOML uh, site, uh, part of the Hurricane Research Division and NOAA down in Florida. And this shows us how much energy is in the water. And in, instead of getting into the physics of it, and the mathematics. Let's just say, uh, for simplicity's sake, that anything on the top end of the scale here is very warm water that runs deep into the ocean. It's not just at the surface. And so if we look, uh, Joaquin is located right in here and is headed towards this area. And that is ocean heat content that's in the upper third of the energy spectrum here. We're talking about a lot of available energy. You can see offshore of the southeast that we also have a very nice area, nice in terms of feeding a hurricane, not nice for people. That's going to be for sure, or at least it seems that way. But this is a lot of energy that's available for this hurricane to tap into, even just off the outer banks of North Carolina, uh, enough ocean heat content in there to fuel uh, a northward moving hurricane if it were to turn into the mid-Atlantic states here from the Carolinas. I don't know if South Carolina so much as North Carolina, the Virginia Capes, Delaware, etc. So this is very important and uh, there's plenty of this ocean heat content sitting out here. It's not late October like we had with Sandy. It's not November. Uh, we have not had other hurricanes roaming through here stirring up the ocean. And so Joaquin has a vast area of energy to work with and that's very important. And that was mentioned uh, in basically in the discussion from the National Hurricane Center that the intensification could continue pretty steadily for the next several days. And it could be that Joaquin gets stronger than what the official forecast is showing, which peaks it out as a major hurricane, 115 miles per hour over that very warm water here of the western and southwestern Atlantic Basin. Now. Looking at actual sea surface temperatures, uh, another fantastic product that we can see what's going on out there in pretty good detail. Uh, basically 26 degrees Celsius and higher, or just about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And that line runs right here, we call that an isotherm or a line of equal temperature. And that line runs about right here, the 26 degrees Celsius line. And so you see that it butts just up against the Carolina coast. And then offshore, we have 28 degrees Celsius and then 29 degrees Celsius farther south and west, which represents water temperatures in the low 80s. But more importantly, like I just mentioned, there is pretty significant upper ocean heat content sitting in this region for Joaquin to tap into. And so if it were to come up, uh, let's say around the 76 uh, degree longitude line and then turn in, and this is just hypothetical here, if it were to do something like this, it's going to have ample warm water. Even if it comes up a little farther to the east and then turns in towards the peninsula here, again, very warm water, but then it cools off in the last 100 plus miles before landfall. 
and that might help things out if it hits further north. So where this makes landfall, assuming that it does, that is not a guarantee yet. We're still waiting on some of these models to sort of hone in on things, and I'll go over that in a minute. But this water temperature profile is, uh, I dare say, dangerous. And uh, hurricanes are dangerous. There's no reason to sugarcoat this. If this makes landfall uh, where it looks like it could, then this could be a very big problem. Now, what's going on with the models? We've seen a lot of talk really dating back to 2012 between the Euro, the ECMWF, and the GFS. Now, the GFS is the North American, well, not North American, because the Canadian has their own from Environment Canada. It is the United States' main operational weather forecasting model, and it's called the Global Forecast System. It has an operational version, which is what we see here, and then it has a whole bunch of uh, what we call ensemble members, or 20 different runs of the model with different variables, and you get different outputs. And then you have the Euro, the ECMWF, and that also has an operational, another one called the control run, and then it has 51 ensemble members. So there's a lot of weather data out there and a lot of model data to look at. The two global model powerhouses usually are the GFS and the ECMWF, or what we call the Euro. Now this is based on last night's run, the Zero Z run. These models are typically run uh, the GFS four times a day, the Euro twice a day, and we use the UTC, or the Universal Time Coordinate for or what we call Zulu time, uh, so that everything's coordinated. And so Zero Z is roughly 8 p.m. Eastern time uh, when these models are initialized and when they are good from, so to speak. All right? So this is what the GFS showed at 102 hours based on last night's run. Powerful hurricane here represented in the 500 millibar chart just off the North Carolina Outer Banks and southeast of the Virginia Capes. Whereas at the same time frame, the Euro had Joaquin way out here in the Atlantic heading towards Bermuda perhaps on a track out to sea. Why did it do that? Well, that is very difficult to explain for the most part, the Euro was trying to sort of erode the ridge of high pressure enough out here to create kind of like a gravitational pull, if you will. That's not what it is, but it's the best way I can describe it, uh, or magnetism to sort of lure uh, Joaquin away from the United States. And so lower heights in the atmosphere would allow this to sort of roll that way, if you think of it as uh, a ball uh, in a gravitational field. Whereas the GFS was capturing the hurricane with much lower heights in the atmosphere associated with this cutoff low. Now all that being said, I'm going to show you the very latest run of the GFS uh, that just finished in the last little while, and you'll see how this works. Okay, so this is the 500 millibar layer of the atmosphere. We have uh, the surface of the Earth and then you know, many layers all the way up to the edge of space. And our weather happens to be down in what we call the troposphere. And um, most of our sensible weather happens there, and that's divided into layers as well. Different wind flows at different layers, and so forth and so on. The atmosphere looks like a topographic map. For those of you that know geography and geology, uh, you have mountains of air and valleys of air, basically ridges and troughs. And you also have energy in the atmosphere. And that's represented very well right here. This is the... Uh, basically the initial condition for where Joaquin is located as I'm doing this recording. Uh, this is at the 500 millibar field, very round in its appearance, clearly a classic Atlantic hurricane, strong, represented well in the model, so no problem there. Over the southeast United States, you start to see the lowering of the heights here, whereas over the Atlantic basin, the western part, uh, we have this pretty strong area of high pressure. This air is dense, thicker, whatever you want to call it, so Joaquin can't just move into it. Uh, the air around Joaquin is lighter. Uh, moist air is actually lighter than dry air, believe it or not. For those of you that know meteorology, you know that. And so this can't just turn into this pretty stout ridge of high pressure out here. You need something to erode it and thin it out to allow this to move towards that lower area of pressure in the steering layer of the atmosphere, and it's just not there. So let's move out into time, and I'll show you what happens. So this is valid 
Uh, like I said, this is uh, right now. We move out into time. We get it on to, into tonight. Uh, trying to see where my time stamp is here. So we're going on out into the overnight hours. This is 2 a.m. on Thursday, and it's really closing in on the Bahamas down here. You see that? So, yeah, you folks in the Bahamas, and I don't mean to laugh with any disrespect. This is, you know, you're in for it. This is a bad hurricane for you in the central Bahamas. Notice, too, that here comes our energy in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, digging south and east, uh, sort of trying to capture Joaquin and scoop it up. The Euro wants to hand it off and go out in this direction due to some energy out here eroding the uh, ridge a little bit. So let's keep moving out into time. This is Thursday uh, in the early morning, afternoon hours, and we're going out to Thursday uh, night. Uh, so this is the zero Z run or the zero Z output for tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night into Friday. Here's the energy over the Tennessee Valley in northern Alabama. And here is our very well-developed hurricane just raking the Bahamas. The slow movement of this is really, really concerning for the Bahamas. No doubt about it. Don't let that get away from us that this is a big problem for the Bahamas. Moving on out into time. Friday morning around sunrise, early Friday morning, headed towards Friday afternoon now. And you notice a couple of things start to happen. Here's our cutoff low starting to dig in uh, over Alabama. And the ridge is really holding strong here, this nice, thick area of high pressure in the atmosphere. And here's sort of the leftovers of Ida trying to carve out enough of a weakness to sort of pull Joaquin away. I know that's not a hard hua sound, but it just slipped out. What can I say? It's trying to pull the hurricane away, uh, and I just don't think it's going to do it, and certainly neither does the GFS. So moving on out into time, Friday evening into Saturday early morning hours, you see what happens here. It's pretty obvious. Here's our cutoff low in the mid to upper levels of the atmosphere. There is Joaquin, and it just kind of rides around uh, the periphery of this, and then on up into the Carolinas, as you're going to see here. I say the Carolinas. It's North Carolina, unfortunately, and parts of southern Virginia. So going on into Saturday morning, there's not enough of a weakness out here, it looks like, for this to turn and then head out to sea. And you can clearly see that as this pinwheels around. I kind of put a dividing line in here. This is like uh, you know, a pendulum, and this is just going around that uh, sort of center of gravity in the middle, if you will. Very fascinating from a meteorological perspective. Not so good for folks along the North Carolina coast. The Outer Banks up here, onshore flow this entire time. Really going to pose a problem for storm surge all the way down the coast here, these high waves that are going to be coming in. And all while this is happening, very important to note, this represents energy along the east coast as well. And the rainfall, which I'm going to show you in a minute, is astounding. So finally, uh, this is the early morning hours of Sunday, Saturday night into Sunday. We see the GFS making a landfall somewhere along the crystal coast of North Carolina, which would be absolutely just devastating for the region. A tremendous storm surge into Pamlico Sound, along the Outer Banks, etc. But then, added to all of this misery, this is still a lot of energy in the atmosphere, and it's going to try to wring that moisture out. You see what happens? The vorticity center of Joaquin spins around uh, the upper level low, and they kind of merge into one. Absolutely incredible to see from a meteorological perspective. For the sake of people, it's too bad it's not happening out here over the open water, even well away from Bermuda, uh, because it really is something to see, and you don't see it very often. Unfortunately, it's going to happen, it looks like, over where people live, and that's never a good thing. The rainfall, this is 72 hours out, I do believe. It might be 48. Let me check. I was incorrect. It is 48 hours. Look, this is the east coast of the United States right here. There's the Carolinas going up to Cape Cod up here. Uh, here's Florida. There's the hurricane. Look at all of this precip that the GFS is showing along sort of this coastal trough that's developing. Strong high pressure over the northern Atlantic. Ample moisture flow out ahead of the hurricane. Similar to Floyd in 1999, which had a huge moisture plume ahead of it. Folks, this map here, it has to alarm you. This is serious. We're talking rainfall. I can't even draw on it because it's the same color. Rainfall in some of this area, 
more than six, more than eight, more than 10 inches in some cases, the Piedmont, the Appalachians, this is going to be a significant problem, uh, and I think that's understating it. You bring a hurricane in on top of this and have it kind of pinwheel around here for a little bit, and then the whole mess heads up the east coast as the trough lifts out with Joaquin captured. I'm not kidding. People need to be ready for this, and we're talking about not just along the coast for the immediate impacts of surge and high winds, but feet of rainfall in some locations, raging rivers, streams turning into lethal flowing water sources. I, I mean, it's just going to be bad. Uh, you want to talk about hype? This is going to hype itself. Uh, no meteorologist or television network or me is going to be able to hype this enough and uh, that's not even the right word for it. It's time to sound the alarm that the fresh water flooding alone should get people very nervous across this region. And you're talking about some big cities in here, Charlotte, Greensboro, Raleigh, the Triangle here up into Richmond, Virginia, the DC area, and then areas along the Appalachians up here, just bad news all around. And on top of that, we could have a significant hurricane landfall coming in right when we don't need it. When do you need it, right? But this is like, this is not good. Uh, that's all there is to it. So, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but, you know, that's my job. i got to tell you what's going on out there, and this is what it looks like, and it doesn't look good at all. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, Hurricane Track, that's our YouTube uh, handle, if you will, and uh, subscribe to us for future updates, as they say. Of course, we do have our app. I'll talk about this just for a moment. Uh, hurricane Impact, it's uh, two words, Hurricane Impact. Um, the iOS version is better than the Android version. We do have an Android version, but it's just so hard to keep that one up to date with all the changes that go on with the Android operating system and you developers out there, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, both of them are out there available, but I, I think the iOS version is more stable. I think you'll really like it. Uh, all of our blog updates, social media, any videos that I post go into the app. It has maps, it has our surge cam when we stick that out there, assuming that we do. Live weather data that will come from our own instrumented weather tower that we're going to set up for this. Uh, so if you want to have what we do on the go, then Hurricane Impact, uh, you know, get it once, pay for it once, and it's yours forever. And we will continue to update it uh, in future years as the technology gets better and better. So that's a great way to keep up with what we're doing. As always, I appreciate you tuning in to my expertise and my knowledge. Uh, I try to talk about what the impact is going to be and sort of rile the troops up to get ready for this uh, without scaring people needlessly. Um, you know, fear is not a good motivator. I think uh, the best way to motivate people is with facts and science and say, hey, look, this is a serious situation. Don't be scared of it. Respect it. Be ready. Be prepared uh, to the best of your ability. And um, the rest will take care of itself, whatever that means. All right, well, that's it for me for today. I'll probably have another update later tonight to you know, take a look at what the afternoon and evening models and so forth show. So look for that on our YouTube channel and in our app and on our social media platforms. Until then, have a great rest of your Wednesday. I am Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll talk to you again tonight.